Okay, um, so this is uh, chapter 10.2, where we're going to actually start to do hypothesis tests dealing with proportions. Okay, so in 10.1, we started talking about the general idea of hypothesis tests, but now we're going to look at specific ones. So again, just to review, the idea is we have a claim. We're going to be talking about proportions in this section. So, right, the true proportion of things is whatever number it is. So 21% of the earth is covered with land or 50, you know, <clears throat> more than 50% of people are going to vote for whoever your favorite candidate is or whatever. Okay, we're going to have a claim. We're going to have data. And the question we're going to ask is, is that claim reasonable compared to the data that we have? Now, this is sort of the reverse of the confidence interval that we did back in chapter nine, because there what we said is, here's data. What are the reasonable values that we could expect that true value to have? Here, we're going to have a specific true value, and we're going to investigate whether or not that's a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so, um, this idea that there are steps to a hypothesis test, I actually really like the way the textbook does this. So I know we don't use the textbook all that much um, in this class, but on page 440 is a really nice walkthrough of how we do that proportion. So I'm gonna suggest that you do actually uh, read the book and look at this part of it. So the idea though is that we're gonna think about whether or not the hypothesis test we're gonna do is reasonable. Remember, NP1 minus V is greater than 10, and the values are independent of each other, and we had a good simple random sample. Okay, then we're going to state the hypothesis. And the way we write that is the null hypothesis is that a proportion is equal to some number that we think is true. And so um, this idea. So our null hypothesis is going to always have an equal sign in it. And it's going to be P is equal to a specific number. So 0.5 or 0.8 or 0.21 or point whatever it is. That's our alternate hypothesis. That's what we're going to end up thinking is true if our data isn't very convincing. And then our alternate hypothesis, which can be one-sided or two-sided, is going to be that our hypothesis is not that. Now, it could be greater than, it could be less than, it could be two-tailed, where we just have this not equal to. Okay, so it's a little bit funny, as we talked about in the last section, that the alternate hypothesis is usually the one that we kind of think is true, and the one that we think our evidence is going to support. So remember, we're going to find evidence to reject the null hypothesis and say that something happened, right? And again, if we think of that court case, a district attorney says that the default setting is that a person is not guilty and only if we have sufficient evidence are they found guilty and they go to jail or do whatever. And so the alternate hypothesis is what the district attorney thinks is true because if they think the person didn't do it, they're not gonna bring charges against that person. Okay, then, getting back to here, we're going to um, figure out what our significance level is gonna be Again, for 95%, that value is 1.96 for a two-sided test. Um, 1.64 was the other number we used. But the idea that the bigger um, the significance, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the smaller the alpha, the bigger the critical value is going to be. And so, right, this would be 0.05 or 0.1 or whatever. Remember, 95% confidence leads to 0.05 significance because it's uh, one minus that because it's the area outside of the little normal curve. Then we're going to calculate our test statistic. And again, StatCrunch or whatever your software is going to be is going to do that actual calculation, right? And that's going to figure out how many standard errors away from our data the hypothesis is, right? So if it's a number near zero, that means that our hypothesis, our hypothesized value is pretty close. And if not, it's going to be bigger than that, right? So if we think our candidate's going to get more than 50% and win, if the actual proportion is 50.2%, maybe that's going to happen and maybe it won't. But if the actual value is 60%, then our sample is going to be much more useful as we do that. 
Okay, then if our value is big enough, and again, it's an absolute value-y kind of thing, then we're gonna reject our null hypothesis and conclude that the value is um, rejectable. And so this idea that the p-value is um, way out there, um, which in right real cases means the p-value is small. So what that says is the percent of samples that would follow this hypothesis, given that all hypothesis is true, is very small. Thus, it's not very reasonable to conclude that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, and again, this idea that if the data is over here, we're going to reject, or if the data is on either end of the outside, right? So this idea about having two-sided, one-sided tests, which again, that uh, book which you should read will explain in more detail, right? This idea, this is a theory question. This is what is it I'm trying to prove, right? Nobody wants to show that the new drug is less good than the old drug. They only want to show that it's better. Finally, the last step of a hypothesis test is to write a sentence in actual English with a verb and stuff. The idea is there is significant evidence to support the alternate hypothesis, or we fail to find evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so here's an example. Um, we have two uh, different soft drinks. Uh, Pepsi used to do this all the time when I was a kid. And we're gonna give 100 people uh, the soft drink and we're gonna ask which one they prefer better. Well, it turns out 65 of them thought that it was better. So our P hat is gonna be 65%. And then the question is, is that enough different than 50% that we could conclude that for any sample, we would find the same evidence, right? Because we know it was true in our sample, but can we generalize that to the broader population? Can we say that our sample is significant as we do that? So step one is we start by explaining it. So the null hypothesis is that it's 50-50. The other hypothesis is they like ours more. It's one-sided because again, showing that the other brand is better isn't what we want to do. Then we go ahead and we algebra it up. Formula P hat minus P zero, right? That's the difference in the two. So how far away is our data from the hypothesis? So in this case, 65% minus 50% divided by that sample error. I'm sorry, the standard error, not the sample error, the standard error, which is now in the bottom of the fraction, right? That's just math, 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 math. Notice that that is the P from the hypothesis. So that's 0.5, not the 0.65. <clears throat> because again, we assume the null hypothesis to be true. We math that up, we get that the value is three. Well, if you remember, three standard deviations away from the mean is pretty far, right? That only happened whatever 0.3% of the time or whatever. So that's pretty good evidence that the difference is real. On the computer, we're going to get an actual p-value. Um, and the p-value, which is here on the next one, is 0 0.0013. So what that tells us is that if it was a 50-50 split, if it really was a coin flip, whether you liked Coke or Pepsi better, we would expect to get 65 out of 100 only 13 out of 10,000 times. And that's pretty unlikely. Unlikely enough that we would say, gosh, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that people like my soft drink better. Okay, and so we're going to finish with that sentence to say we have statistically significant evidence to support that idea. Okay, here's another example. Um, in 1994, 52% of people thought that um, not enough math and science was taught in high school. And then in a recent study, um, it was 256. So the question is, is it different? So this is a two-sided test because it doesn't have a direction. We're just gonna investigate whether or not it's different. And we do that, we started off with it's different from the old data. So the old data was 52%. So our null hypothesis is P is 0.52. Our alternate is gonna have the not equal to, which is the sign that it's a two-sided test. All right, we're gonna find our sample proportion, 256 out of 800, that's 32%. Now again, 32% is clearly less than 52%, but is that enough different that we are sure that things have changed? Well, we math that up and we get a minus 11. And again, minus 11 is gigantic, right? It's totally off the chart. And when we do that, um, we can interpret that. And again, it comes out to be so close to zero that the computer can't tell. The computer doesn't have enough decimal places. We would actually never really say it's equal to zero because nothing's impossible, but it's statistically impossible. That tells us we reject. So 
our sentence then is going to be there's statistically significant evidence that the proportion of parents who think that uh, their high schools don't teach enough STEM is uh, too little. So it's very different than it was in 1994. Okay, and again, that's the assumption of our um, <clears throat> hypothesis and this idea that showing whether or not our data is in line with our hypothesis or it's so different that we have to conclude that something else is going on. That's what's happening here. Again, this is the one uh, section where I think you really ought to read the book, chapter 10. You should probably read the whole chapter. It's only like 20 pages long. I know you love reading, but I think you'll be happy that you did it because it really will explain this idea of how different is different enough that we really think uh, something's going on. We'll have chapter 10.3 here soon, uh, which looks at uh, the same hypothesis test idea for the mean. And of course it uses the T distribution like we did last chapter.